us. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that as I speak today, your word would touch people's hearts and you would encourage us and you would deposit in us your ideas and your dreams for our life. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have your Bible, go to Ephesians chapter 5. Today we're talking, we're in a series called Big God. And today we're going to, yeah, last week we talked about big prayers. Today we're going to talk about big dreams. How many of you would say you have big dreams? When I was in junior high, this was my dream because I came from a basketball family. And so I would get in our, our driveway and my dad made a basketball hoop for us. And I would I'd get in, in, in my driveway for hours after school and I would I'd play basketball and I'd, I'd, I would really seriously be like, Fry from the outside, you know what I mean? Like from downtown, oh, he misses, ah, rebound, misses again. You know, I, was, I, was, I, I would play the game and I wanted to be an NBA guy. That's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be an NBA player when I was in junior high. When I was before that, I wanted to be a cowboy. And then way before that, I wanted to be an Indian. And uh, so remember those when you were a kid? I want to be a cowboy. And uh, so we all have dreams that, that we have in our lives. But some of our dreams, I'm just going to say it, and you might be offended a little bit today, but bear with me. Some of our dreams are really selfish. Would you agree? Some of our dreams are self-centered, uh, self-centered dreams. Some of our dreams are really a God thing. And so today we're going to talk about God's dreams in our heart, his vision for our life. And I'm going to go as, as quick as I can because there's a lot to cover here. But when I was a little boy, uh, about seven years old, I was sitting in the Reading Civic Auditorium where there was a concert going on, a Christian concert. And I remember it as clear as a bell. And uh, my mom was there and some friends and this guy got up and played his guitar, and I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. And then he preached about Jesus, and I, I said to my mom as I, as I was standing there, I said, hey, mom. I pulled on her, her little dress, and I said, that's what I'm going to do someday. I'm going to be a preacher someday. And she patted me on the head and said, oh, that's nice. <laughs> and I slept with a Billy Graham book. When I was a little boy, I used to carry a little Billy Graham book around with me uh, for a while, not all my days of my life, but for a while, and I would sleep with this Billy Graham book, and I used to say, I'm, I'm going to be a preacher of the gospel. I'm going to help people find Jesus. Now, do you think that that dream was uh, just a, a flesh dream or, or a spirit of God dream? I believe it was a spirit of God dream. And all of us have little things that God has deposited into our life. And I want to read you a verse, and we're going to read through a bunch of scripture. You don't, you don't need to write, you just write it down, because I'm, I'm going to go kind of quick, because the first page is really for free. This is not part of the, yeah, it is part of the message, but it's just going to set it up. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. How many of you go, that's the struggle of my life. I don't know what the Lord wants me to do. Raise your hand if that's you. I'm not sure what the Lord wants me to do. A lot of times the dream of God, the vision of God for our life is right in front of us, but we're always looking for the big thing in the sky and the way at the end of the rainbow, and the Lord's like, it's right in front of you. So today we're going to talk through what it would be that you would understand the Lord's heart and what he wants you to do. Jeremiah 1.4 says this, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, he's talking to Jeremiah here, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you and ordained you to be a prophet. So watch this. In your mama's belly, God knew you. And he had a plan for your life. And he, he, he ordained specific things inside of you. I believe that some of you, when you were in your mother's womb, the Lord made you an artist. The Lord made you have the gift to be a doctor. The Lord gave you the gift to deal with money and to manage money. And the Lord gave some of us the gift of speaking or the gift of, of hospitality or whatever that is. And so I double dog, triple dog, quadruple dog dare you. That's a lot of, that's a lot of double, double dogs here. To ask the Lord, what were you thinking about when you made me? What was in your heart when you put me inside of my mother's womb and you, and you gave me a gift and you gave me a talent? What were you thinking about? If you've never asked the Lord that, do it. Just tonight when you're all alone, laying in your little bed, just say, Lord, what were you thinking about when you made me? What was on your mind? Because the enemy's good at telling us what, what, we're, what we're bad at and what, what we've struggled with in life and the pain that's come upon our life. But, but the Lord's coming 
to speak to us his word and his will and his ways and his gifts inside of us. If you don't know that, life is tough. Serving God, you're always going to be like, I don't know if I'm doing what I should be doing. So here's the question. Here's your dreams, your vision, your purpose, whatever you want to label it. It all basically means the same thing. Have you ever thought about this? I asked the Lord this the other day. I said, God, what are your dreams? I know what people dream about, but God, what do you dream about? And I picked up my Bible and I started looking at all the pages in here. And I said, wow, God, you have a lot of dreams for us. You have a lot of hopes and a lot of things that you'd like to see us do. I I wrote three down that I want to share with you that are God dreams. You should write this down. John 13, 34 says this, "A uh, a new commandment I give to you. That you would love one another as I have loved you. So also you must love one another. So part of God's dream and God's plan for this church and for his body worldwide is that we would love one another. That's in the heart of God. That's a dream he has. And so don't slander. Don't gossip. Don't be a jerk. Quiet. How many of you want to be jerks? Raise your hand. No, nobody does. Love one another. Why? It's in the heart of God. That's his dream for his people, that we would get along and we would love another one, uh, uh, one another. The second one is that none should perish. I love this. This is the dream of God. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What's the dream of God? What's in the heart of God? That everybody on the planet would know his son, Jesus. That's, that's his dream. That's, his, that's why he sent Jesus. That's why he made us, so that we that know him can go out and share the love of God with others. That's in the heart of God. You should be asking the Lord every day, Lord, let me be part of that dream that you have in your heart to win people to Jesus. And the third one is this, that we would love him. That we would love him. Matthew 22, verse 34. A lady just said to me after the first service, Pastor Rick, it's time. You start wearing your glasses when you preach, because I can tell you're squinting. I rebuked her flat out, right on the spot. Man. I tried to find my glasses, and I couldn't find them. So, Matthew 22, verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they, part, or they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, of course, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Watch. They're standing around. They're trying to find a way to pin Jesus and get him to say something blasphemous. And there's a lawyer in their midst, and he goes, I got this, boys. And they're like, yeah, yeah, you're the lawyer. You love to ask questions that trap people so that you can have your way. That's perfect. Go do it. If you're a lawyer, I love you. Bless you. He says, hey, Jesus, what's the greatest thing in here? What's the greatest commandment? By the way, it would have been like, Without the the New Testament, it would have been right here. What's the greatest thing that we can do? Are you kidding me? Small words, thin pages, lots of words. What's the one thing? I would have probably just melted right there. I'd be like, well, let's see. Wash your hands before you eat. No, wait. There's all these laws that we have. And Jesus breaks it down and just silences them. He says, "Here's the. you want to hear what the greatest thing is? That you would love God. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That is the reason why God made you. He made you so he could love you. And he made you so that you could love him. You were made for love. And I'm not talking about some weird, distorted, perverted love. I'm talking about the awesome love that the Father has for us, that we would receive that. And then here's what's cool, is that then we would love him back. That's the dream of God. I want to be part of that dream. I want to help people love God, and I want to love God every day to the best of my ability. Here's another double dog dare. When you're sitting home tonight, I do this. I don't want to paint bad pictures or anything, but we have that big, we have a big bathtub. One of those sunk-in ones, you know what I'm saying? One of those drought tubs, that's what I call it, I call it a drought tub. I've turned my sprinklers off on my lawn so that I can, you know, do the bath. And I ask the Lord this often. Father, how are we doing? How am I doing? Not how am I doing at pastoring. Not how big is the church or how small is the church or how many people are upset or how many people this or how many that or this or that. Father, how are we doing? How is my love meter? 
Do I love you? Lord, is there any place in me that is um, a, a place where compromise could creep in? By the way, ask the Lord that. Be prepared for the answer. And he doesn't do it out of hatred. He does it out of affection for us. He says, yeah, this is a problem. This has the ability to steal from you. I want you to get rid of it. See, I want to partner with God in his dream that I would love him with all my heart, with all my soul. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this. For I know, this is God speaking. For I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a hope and a future. By the way, I was preaching uh, in a Bible college once. And, you know, I'm up in front of all the, you know, people and just, you know, little jabs for Jesus, just tearing it up in this. You know, and a guy comes up, well, excuse me, I'll talk to you. And I was like, oh, bro, here we go. You can't quote Jeremiah 29, 11 in the context of God towards us. And I said, well, what are you talking about? He says, well, that was for the Israelites. That wasn't for us. So therefore, you're taking that scripture out of context. I wanted to elbow that guy so bad. I was like, Jesus, I'll do it right now if you let me. And I said to him, well, well hold on a second. Are God's thoughts towards me good? And he said, well, cer well, certainly. Does he have evil thoughts towards me? No. Does he have a future and a hope for me? And he goes, yeah. And I just went, mic drop. See ya. <laughs> of course he does. I can quote that scripture. Why? Because it's the heart of God, the character of God, and the nature of God. He has thoughts towards you that are good and not evil to give you a hope and a future. He has plans for you. And you've got to learn to walk them out. And everyone in here has a dream, and everyone in here is dreaming of something. The American dream is a great dream, but sometimes that American dream turns into a nightmare. Amen? Oh, I just want to get and goot and stuff and houses and cars and money and blah, 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 blah. And the next thing you know, the American dream turns into a nightmare because you're so invested in this life here that you're not kingdom-minded anymore. I was talking to a guy who's super, super rich, has, has a lot of money. And he said, oh, man. Being rich is hard sometimes. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, this is hard. you got so much to manage. And I go, yeah, but you don't sit around thinking about how you're going to pay your car payment and your power bills. He goes, no, but I sit around thinking about, and he laid out all this stuff. And I said, well, I'll, I'll make you a deal. Let me try it for a month. <laughs> he said, no, no deal. But this man is invested in the kingdom. He's invested in the things of God. And the Lord, the Lord wants to take those, some people are gifted to, to, to have wealth and to, and to prosper because it's for the kingdom. And when we can figure out that our prosperity isn't just for cars and houses, nothing wrong with those things. But when those things own us, then there's a problem. Or watch, those things are our identity. When we start to say, I'm good because I live in Danville. I'm good because I live in Alamo. I'm good because I live here, or because I live there, because I own this, because I drive this, because I have this. Right here, ready? You're in trouble. Because now your identity is in stuff rather than in the Lord. And who you are as a son or a daughter. And by the way, those things aren't bad. Paul said, hey, command the rich. Remember this verse? Command the rich not to be haughty. He didn't say, command the rich not to be rich. He didn't say that. He said, command the rich not to be what? Haughty and to trust in uncertain riches. Are riches uncertain? When that stock market goes down every time, I watch everybody just flip out. Oh my gosh. You're trusting in uncertain riches. they here today, gone tomorrow. The Lord and his word, never gone. Never diminished. So learn to take your, your wealth... And no matter how wealthy you are, whether you think you're not or you're totally wealthy, take your wealth and say, God, what's in your heart for me? Why did you give this to me? What's in your passion for your kingdom that you want to see me help become part of? It's a big deal. It was super quiet during those points. So how do we steward God's plan for our lives and how do we respond, listen, and know the season we're in, in the pathway to the dream that God has for us? Two things, write them down. You ready? There's two types of dreams that I think are the most problematic for all of our lives. Number one, delayed dreams. Does anybody have a delayed dream? No? Yeah, I've got two people. Good. Good. The rest of you are amazing. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. 
Zechariah and Elizabeth want to have a child. They can't have a child. An angel comes to them while Zechariah is doing his priestly duty. Watch this, that he had done every single day. And he was just being faithful. And an angel shows up to him. And this is what the angel says. Listen, Luke 1.5. Now there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God. Say both righteous. You've got to remember that. Uh, they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in their years. And the angel comes and basically breaks down and says... Uh, your child's going to be John the Baptist, basically. And, and there was 400 years of silence between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew. Stay with me. 400 years, the last thing God, for thousands of years, God was doing and saying and doing and saying, and then he pushed the pause button in Malachi, and for 400 years, there was complete silence. This was the first break in the silence. The angel Gabriel came to tell this guy who had been faithful that, hey, you're going to have a son, and his name's going to be John. And he was like, whoa, 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 nobody in my family's name is John. That's like a New Yorker name. <laughs> Let's name him like Ceramifith or something, but not John. <laughs> and the angel says, hey, because of your unbelief, you're not going to be able to speak until your child's born. And he comes out, and he's like, God spoke, and he can't say anything. He's like... And everyone's like, what went on in there? There's something, something happened. And you know the story, John comes along and is born, and he writes, his name shall be John, and his tongue is loosed, and he begins to declare the wonderful things of God. Listen to me. Delayed dreams. There's times when the Lord, there, there are things that the Lord said to me, and I'm not joking about this, 30 years ago, th three zero years ago. And he said, this is what I'm going to do. And I said, oh, man, amen, come on, Lord. 30 years later, I'm just starting to see the stuff break through the soil. 30 years. You see, we received the promise way back here. We received the dream. We received God's prophetic uh, word for our life. And I put it this way. The proclamation, the process, the purpose, and the possession is all part of the deal. The purpose God speaks. He speaks a promise to you, and he says, hey, man, I've, I've got this great thing you're going to do, and I'm going to use you powerfully, and you're going to be amazing. And you go, sweet. And then you start walking from the promise, and you go, well, Lord, it's been 60 days. What's going on? Lord, it's been three months. Lord, it's been a year. Lord, it's been five years. Lord, it's been 15 years. Lord, we're 25 years into this gig. What are you doing? And he goes, watch this. And a lot of times, in the long middle is where we run into problems. From the promise to the possession of it is where we get messed up as believers. We get bitter at God. We get bitter at people. We don't know what God's doing. We're frustrated. Instead of staying in the saddle of faithfulness. Could you imagine that guy? Zacharias knows they can't have kids. It's just, but he keeps coming to the church and he keeps being faithful. I don't know what specifically his duties were, but let's just say he was a greeter. He's handing people bulletins. Hey, yeah, God bless you. God bless you. Years and years and years of being faithful, 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 faithful. Oh, this is boring. Faithful. <laughs> faithful. Faithful. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> fruitful. A lot of us believers never get to the fruitful because we give up in the faithful. You, you want, I'm going to say it one more time. A lot of us never get to the place of fruitfulness because we don't hang in the place of faithfulness. We get the promise and we're like, we're like yeah, man, it, it's not happening. So, Lord, I'm going I'm to quit going to church. I'm going to quit serving you because you're not holding up your end of the bargain. And the Lord's like, no, 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 I'm holding up my end of the bargain. The problem is, is you don't like the fact that the dream's not going to die. You're going to die. I used the long middle to kill you. It's like, What? If you follow Moses through his 40 years in the desert, and you could spiritually see, you could see a little tombstone where part of Moses died, and where part of Moses died, and where part of Moses died, and then he becomes a great deliverer. The dream's not dead. 
you are. And it's a good thing. See, when I, when I heard from the Lord, uh, you know, 30 years ago that I was going to do such and such for the Lord and this was going to happen in my life, I started going, right? I'm the man. I'm awesome. And the Lord goes, and oh, we got a problem. <laughs> Some people, it's the five-year long middle. Fry man, it's going to be 30 years for you because got, you got some dying to do, right? See, Christianity is the only place where you die to live, right? Every, I watched a, a documentary last night on the Church of Scientology, and um, I was amazed at what I saw in this documentary. If that's not the most self-serving, flesh-driven thing I've ever seen, it's all about you and how great you are and amazing. It's flesh and you and you and you. And here's the Lord. Come to me, and I'll give you life. Okay, now die. Die to yourself. Die to your desires. Die to your wants. Die to your dreams, and give your heart to me. And watch me give you life. Amen? So it's the process that we lose it in. It's this long middle that we have problems. And so the preparation of the long middle can be the place where you and I get all boogered up. And we don't understand. And what we have to understand is, the Lord's more concerned, please hear me, the Lord's more concerned with you than your dreams. Although he wants to do great things through you, but he's more concerned with your heart and your character and your love and your life than he is just about the dream becoming a reality. American Idol has hurt us, right? Everybody wants to be famous and money and I just want everybody to know me. I'm American Idol. Yay! I want to be an American Idol. It's like, why? Why do you want to be an American Idol? because I want to be famous. I'm like, yeah, I get it. But see, the problem is we get so wrapped up in the fleshly side of that thing, and maybe there is somebody that's going to be American Idol, and the Lord's going to use them, and they're going to bring Jesus to people. I've not seen that work very well. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> when I was in Burbank pastoring with movie stars and musicians that were in our church, the problem became is that it was hard to carry Jesus with them because Jesus was demanding them to die to themselves. And they didn't want to. They wanted to be on the next magazine. They wanted to be famous and stay in the, in the limelight. And, I'm, and I would talk to him and say, dude, hard to follow Jesus and take the cross with you when you're crossing. Remember when they used to, Christian music used to be called crossover music? They'd be like, yeah, I was a Christian artist, and now I'm going to cross over secular so I can win some people for Jesus. I remember a guy told me this, and I was like, problem is, bro, you forgot the cross. You, like, left the cross back here. So... All you're doing is singing about your girlfriend and being positive, and nobody's getting saved because you're positive. People get saved because the name of Jesus and the word of God comes out of your mouth. They're not getting saved because you're cool. You get it? And he's like, oh, I don't like you anymore. I'm not coming to your church. <laughs> Toodaloo. <laughs> Delayed dreams are a problem, but we're going to stay faithful in the delay. Amen? Two, dead dreams. Anybody have a dead dream? We're just like, ah, it's just dead. It just doesn't feel like it's alive anymore. Genesis 18, you know the story. God speaks to Abraham, says, Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. He's going to be amazing. And how long did that take? 20 years. A long time for that to come to pass. And so the angel comes. Now, listen, his wife, Sarah, knows that the Lord spoke to Abraham that he's going to have a son. And she comes to him at one point and says, hey, dude, what's up? This ain't working. We're not getting pregnant. So I got an idea. Abraham's like, yeah, talk to me. Talk to me. I'm going to bring my maidservant to you, and you're going to sleep with her and get her pregnant, and then that'll be the promise. That'll be the boy. I don't know what's weirder. <laughs> Abraham agreed to it or that Sarah brought it up? Don't you struggle with that? Like my wife, there's no way that would ever happen. <laughs> she'd be like, she had a frying pan in her hand. You're going to come back dead if you do that. Listen, they birthed, birthed Ishmael. And the Bible says that Ishmael would always ha be a problem and there would always be issues between the two. And by the way, there is to this day, but God bless them, right? God has a plan for everybody. And so here's the problem. Plan B was not God's plan. 
And oftentimes when we're in the long middle of God dealing with us and preparing us, we birth Ishmael's because we're impatient. And we settle for second when the Lord's going, hey, just a few more years, buddy, and the promise is there. And then you know the story. Here, I, just, I love this part of the, of the story. Genesis 18, uh, verse 10. And he said, this is the angel talking with Abraham. He says, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old. Say old. old. Yeah. Well advanced in age. I mean, they're really digging in here in Scripture that they were seriously old. Well advanced in age. And Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure? And my Lord being really old. In other words, watch this. She hears this and she laughs and she says, wait a second. I'm not, I'm not producing babies. And that guy, have you seen him? <laughs> Super old. I mean, he is old as dirt. And we're going to have a baby? How's this even going to work? There's not even an attraction anymore. I don't even see how this is going to work. Viagra? I don't know. <laughs> see, that's how we process, don't we? And here's the Lord. God in heaven, nothing is too difficult for me. I'm a big God. If I want to make a dream come out of a dead place, that's my business. You see, and most of us look at our lives and go, well, I'm dead, I'm crippled, I'm hurting here, I don't have this. We talk ourselves down into being nothing. And we're, we're so concerned with what's dead in us that we're not even really seeing that God, who is amazing, can breathe life into dead things because he's the resurrection and the life, the Bible says. So your dead dream, it isn't so much that your dream is dead, it's that you're dying in the process so that he can do the great thing that he wants to do inside of you. So when the dream becomes a reality, it's not a nightmare. I always get very concerned for preachers and pastors that, that, that come too quick and they, in the flesh they try to promote themselves into a great thing and they write books and they just want to get on the, the circuit and become great. I always get concerned for those guys because nine times out of ten they, they fall somewhere. Because their character doesn't match their gift. Their gift is big and their character is small. And you see, the reason why God puts big gifts in us is so that in the long middle, he can give us big character. And he can wrap more wire around us, if you will, so more power can flow through us. Because he loves us, because he cares for us. Because in the long middle is where we get to know him. That's in the long middle is where dead things come to life again. If we'll just hold on. Who's holding on? I'm holding on. I don't want Ishmael. I don't want a plan B. I don't want plan C. I want God's plan for my life, and I know you do too. Dead dreams, God is amazing at bringing them back to life, speaking life into them. I'm going to end with four quick points, and then we're going to pray. I want to read you something out of Scripture, John chapter 12, verse 20. And I'm letting you know right now that I'm going to use this verse a wee bit out of context, not for the reason because I want to preach heresy, but because I believe there's truth in here for this message, okay? So we don't need emails. I'm just letting you know right away. John 12, verse 20. <clears throat> now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. Love that. How many of you love Greek food? Come on. I don't know why I said that. Probably because it's getting close to lunch. <laughs> so these came to Philip, who was from uh, Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. There's people here who want to see you. And Jesus answered and said to them, The hour uh, has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat it falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this, in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Jesus was speaking about his life. Watch this. This is a huge point. Jesus was saying that he's going to be crucified. He was going to die on the cross, be put in the earth. Three days later, rise from the dead, and much fruit would come from that. The world would be saved. We're sitting here today because of that action. Now, it's the same truth, I believe, about dreams, about when, when God drops a dream into our heart, there's a reason why it gets put in the soil and dies for a season. There's a reason why those things get buried, because it's in that place that we find him. 
It's in that place. Whoever loses his life will find it. The kingdom is completely backwards to this world. This world says, get what you want. Promote yourself. Be the man. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. The kingdom works this way. Be a servant. Love people. Consider yourself last. Let, Let that guy go ahead of you in line at the grocery store. Yeah? You ever done that? You're coming up. It's busy in the store. You got your cart. This lady's got her cart. There was a lady at Safeway over here by Blackhawk the other day. I almost died. I was coming down the aisle going for my lane. I was in my lane. Aisle 7 was open. The light was on. Nobody was there. And I'm just, you know, I'm coming down from the fruit section. And here comes this lady out of the soda. You know, soda's evil. That's why. She's coming down the soda lane just, I mean, flying. And there's the thing, and it's blocked, and, and, and I, whoa, you know, I'm swerving slow motion. Everything goes into slow motion. Wheat thins are flying everywhere. I, I'm sideways, and she's, she didn't even bother turning. She just. <laughs> Sorry, camera guys. That was my lane, lady. And for just a second, for just a second, I was like, You know what I said to her? That's what I said to her. Do you have insurance, ma'am? That's what I said to her. And she turned around and looked at me and said, excuse me? I just wanted to know if you had insurance because we almost collided. She was like, ah, ha, ha, ha. Extra five minutes to get out of the store for me. Extra whole five minutes. I stood in the line just... How much stuff does she have? (laughs) And the Lord's like, dude, why do you feel like you got to be first all the time? Like, do you know this is a small symptom of a greater problem in your life? I'm like, oh, Jesus. Do we got to do this at Safeway? (laughs) Aisle seven? So I'm asking the Lord to forgive me, Lord. Just want to make sure this lady's out of the parking lot before I leave crash into me. By the way, if you're here today, I love you. God bless you. <laughs> that would be awkward, huh? Hi. Taylor. Four truths. Listen, that just got weird. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Four truths about a surrendered life and about dreams. I want to give them to you real fast, and then we're going we're gonna to pray. No problem. That was awkward. Number one, listen, God dreams versus your dreams. Here's truth about the surrendered life before the Lord. One, God dreams multiply. Your dreams don't. And what do I mean by that? Whatever God does, he doesn't do addition. He doesn't believe in addition. If you look in scripture, he doesn't do addition. He always does multiplication. He's always a bigger God than we are. We're always going, if I could just have one more. And the Lord's like, give me your lunch. We'll feed 5,000 people and you'll have 12 baskets full. He's always the God of multiplication, right? He's always doing that. God, when a God dream is in your heart, it will multiply, and the surrendered dreams become multiplied things. But when you hang on to them for dear life, and and you decide that you're going to burst on Ishmael, they don't multiply. And if they do, it's addition, and it's in the wrong direction, and it's a pain in your life. God dreams will multiply. Two, God dreams sustain other people. This is powerful. I want you to catch this. Jesus died on the cross. Just like the seed, he died, he came out, and now there's billions of people in history that have known him and loved him. A God dream multiplies. The thing in your life multiplies, and then it sustains others. Remember jo- uh, Joseph? Joseph, I've told you the story a hundred times. I don't want to belabor it, but you know the story, right? I'm, I- I'm going to be great. And his dad sews him a nice coat, you know, and his dad says, like, hey, man, you know, you're the best kid I got. I'm so proud of you. And all the brothers are like, you yeah, little Joey. I just, I don't like him. And then he's the only kid that gets to ride the new donkey. I mean, all this stuff. And, and so he, he, he has a dream one time in chapter 50 uh, in Genesis. And he comes to his brothers and says this. By the way, this is a bad idea. Don't do this. <laughs> Seriously, like, there's certain people you shouldn't share your dreams with because they're going to smash them. Be careful. I don't share God dreams with very many people because people don't have big faith. 
they're too earthly in their mind. And they're like, well, how are you going to do that? I don't know. Big God, he told me we're going to do it. Do you get what I'm saying? Don't share your dreams with too many people. So Joseph goes to his brothers and he's like, hey guys, I'm going to be better than all of you. I had a dream from the Lord last night. And you're, you came to me and your sheaves bowed down to mine and I'm going to be better than you. And I got Joseph. Don't do that. They see him. You know the story. He's captured. He's sold into slavery. God blesses him. He becomes the servant in the house. And he, he's the man. And you know the story. Potiphar's wife, Floozy. She, she starts to come after Joseph. And I've said it before. I'm going to say it again because I don't want you to ever forget it. The devil doesn't tempt with ugly. ugly. <laughs> Am I right? I mean, it's, it's not like... It's not like Potiphar's wife had a little hump and a little mustache. And... <laughs> Joseph, come here. <laughs> she wasn't the lady at the county fair, right? At the behind. The... <laughs> Every day, tempted her, tempted her, tempted her, tempted, tempted him, tempted him, tempted him. So if it was temptation. It means that it was temptation. It, he was looking at it. And he didn't do it. And you know the story. She cries rape. He gets thrown in prison. And he's in prison. What gives? Let's go way back to Zachariah and Elizabeth. What did it say about them? They were both. A lot of times the long middle causes us to think that the delay and the problems are somehow God's commentary about how he feels about us. When their delay and the things that were dead in them were actually God said of them, they were both righteous and they were doing right things. So if we're, not, if, we're not, if we're not super careful, we'll misinterpret the long middle as God being mean to us. When really, Joseph was in the prison being what? Prepared. Because there was way too much of Joseph when he had his dream, and not enough of the father. And now, all these years later, there was time for that to come to pass, and what happened? He sustained life through them. God used him to save an entire bunch of people. Listen to this. Genesis 50, verse 19, Joseph said to them, to his brothers, by the way, his brothers show up to get grain. <laughs> and he's like, oh my gosh, they don't recognize me. And he messed with them for a little while. You gotta read it, it's pretty funny. Um, but he could have killed them right there on the spot. He was, had that much power in the government. You're dead. And a lot of times our pain causes us to be bitter at people. And Joseph understood that God was doing something. Listen to what he says to him. Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for, I am in the pl uh, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant uh, evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about, uh, as it is this day, to save many people's uh, lives. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them. I don't know about you, but it's easy to get bitter. And God dreams understand that God's working something out and that it actually sustains other people. See, I want a vision that's bigger than me. I want a vision that's bigger than you. I want a church that feeds others and blesses others and does things that are far bigger than me and far bigger than what I can do. Your dreams that are from God are going to sustain other people's lives. Some of you are business owners. Listen to me. Hear this. This is important. Some of you own businesses and you employ people. Did you know that your vision and your gift, God is using you to help provide for other families and be a blessing to those families? Stop seeing it as just a business for you to make cash. Start seeing it as the Lord using you to bless other people. Amen? Amen. Three, God dreams have internal uh, or eternal uh, impact. God dreams have eternal impact. In other words, I'm going to say this politely. There are people in this world that are amazing, that are on magazines, that you and I look at and go, wow. And they're, if they don't receive Jesus Christ, the day they get before the Father, their life doesn't matter. None of it matters. Their houses, their stuff, their boats, their, their cash, their airplanes, it doesn't impress Jesus one bit. He's not going to be like, oh, Tiger Woods? Wow, I have a special place for you because you hit a golf ball long ways. Are you kidding me? The Lord holds the universe in the span of his hand. That 300-yard drive is really kind of, the Lord's like, <laughs> I could flick that ball and it would go for days. Or that business owner, Bill Gates. Bill Gates? What? 
the maker of windows? Get out of here. I don't like windows. I'm a Mac guy. <laughs> Listen, it doesn't matter. Now, if Jesus is in here and the dreams of God and those people are using their gifts for the Lord, it matters a lot in the kingdom. For you can do nothing without me, Jesus said. But with me, what can you do? All things. Anything. God dreams have eternal impact. I want to share this with you fast. And my last point is super quick. I looked up eternal rewards in heaven. I started studying out crowns that the Bible says that the Lord's going to give to us on that day. Listen to this. I just want to go through the list. Number one, crown of righteousness for those who love the Lord's appearing. People that just love that the fact Jesus is coming. 2 Timothy 4.8 says, the incorruptible crown, the people that disciplined their bodies and had self-control, 1 Corinthians 9.25. In other words, you just didn't give in to the spirit of the world. You actually resisted sin and said, no, I'm not doing it. I'm going to live for God. There's a crown for that. Three, the crown of life for people who endured patiently through trials. James 1.12, Revelation 2.10. The crown of life for people, watch, who endured through the long middle and stuck it all the way out until they saw the Lord's face. There's a crown for that. I just want to have one. Listen to this. Four, the crown of glory. I've never seen this before. This is amazing. Godly leaders who were examples to the flock, 2 Peter 5, 2, 4. I hope I get one of those someday. Crown, and, and then here's the other one. Number five, crown of rejoicing for those who win souls to Jesus. Isn't that amazing? 1 Thessalonians 2, 9, Dan 12, uh, Daniel chapter uh, 12, verse 3. Rewards for those who win the race and the prize of eternal life. Rewards from Jesus for overcoming, Revelation 21, 7. Rewards from Jesus. Our dreams live before God. Our gifts laid before God have eternal impact, yeah? It's going to be awesome. Guys, heaven, I've said this to you a million times because I want you to get it. Heaven is not white clouds and me and you riding around playing a harp. <sighs> Who wants to do that for all eternity? This ring, ring, this is boring. Pass your friends. Hey, buddy, it's been a couple thousand years. Yeah that's not heaven heaven is the presence of Jesus the power of God the gold streets the crowns the things the promises that he pours out on us it's gonna it's tangible just like this pulpit it's not spiritual in that sense did you know it's a real tangible place and if you know Jesus Christ as your savior you're going there so why not go ahead and like I know we do the stock markets let's throw some stuff in the kingdom stock market because that's where we're going to live forever. The house you're in right now, it's not going to be here forever. Amen? Thank God. Can you imagine having to get to heaven and be like, oh, the wiring's bad in this house. You're going to have to deal with it. <laughs> nah, geez, really? How much is the payment? Four, last one, one of my favorite ones. John 12, 26, we just read it. Jesus said, if anyone serves me. How many people? anyone. The Father will honor him. What? The fourth one is this. God dreams bring honor. I know people who have dreams that actually bring dishonor to themselves and to their families. I know men who have left their families, and I know women who have left their families in a pursuit to be happy. I just want to be happy. I just want to be a happy person. And I don't feel like me and my husband are in love anymore. And my kids are kind of a pain. And little Johnny over there, he likes me. You go, you've never had. Yes, I've, I've, yes, I've, yes, I've talked to many, many, many families where this has happened. And she goes off or he goes off. And five years later, they come back. They're ruined. Their life is miserable. Their kids don't want to talk to them. Why? Because their dream had no honor in it. I want to have dreams in my heart and live a life that someday my father in heaven just blows me away. I don't even, I can't comprehend it. When I'm standing there, probably, I'll, I'll probably be laying down. I don't think I'm going to be standing. I think I'm going to be eating some gold streets at that moment. And he's going to lift us up and he's going to say, you honored me. You honored my son. Now I'm going to honor you. She said, no, 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 God doesn't honor us, we honor him. Well, Jesus just said that his father would honor us. I want to be at that party. 
Amen? I want to be at a party where the Father's honoring people. And I want to stand, I do, I just want to stand there and watch you get your crown. And just be like, yeah. Instead of this, I, I watch the Country Awards, CMT, I think they call it. And then, you know, the Grammys and all that stuff, and the CMT Awards, you know, the country guys, and all their songs sound the same when I watch it. I'm like, wow, there's not too much creativity going on. They're all singing about trucks and dirt roads and <laughs> girls in tight shorts. And like, you guys are geniuses. That's a good line. And they come up, and they're like, they introduce the guy. Bah, rah, whatever that guy's name is. And he comes up, and they're, and they get that gold thing. They get that gold award, and they're like, mm, yeah, and everyone goes, whoa, and I know because I've counseled people that are famous. I've spent time in my living room with people that are famous, and they say, yeah, I go home, and I take the award, and I put it on my shelf, and I go get drunk, and I go to bed because I'm miserable, and I go, what? You're amazing. Everyone thinks you're amazing, and they go, yeah, I'm dead on the inside. I'm doing this and I got money. I, I got all the money and stuff I want and I'm, I'm literally lonely and I feel terrible. And I go like this. It's because you're not dr living dreams that God wants you to live that brings honor to you and not dishonor to you. See, your father loves you and he wants you to do things that bring honor to him so he can honor you. Amen? Amen. Some of you go, you've never talked to people. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. It's funny because you see him out there and they're like, and I, and I know what happens when they walk off that stage and jump in their car. <sighs> Completely different. How many of you want God dreams? Oh, I do. Let's pray. Let's pray. We're not, we're not out early tonight. Darn it. The Baptists are beating us to the restaurant right now, even as we speak. <laughs> Father, we just, uh, first of all, God, thank you that we're all here. These people are here because they love you and because they want to grow. And they're not here because they, 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 they don't love you. They're here because they love you. So, Father, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus that you would pour your spirit out upon every person here, that you would plant dreams inside of every person in this place. God, I'm asking you that the dream that is in your heart for them, you would put inside of them. And you would, over the next few days, they would even understand a little more about what you've called them to do. And Lord, we want, to, we want to serve you. We want our dreams to multiply for your kingdom. We want our dreams to sustain people. God, we want honor from you. We really do. We want to have eternal impact. With all eyes closed, my eyes are far left of this building. You're left. And if you would say, man, I need Jesus. I need Jesus to come into my heart. I, I'm not, I don't even know if I know the Lord, one, two, or I'm walked away from the Lord and I need to come back home. My eyes are moving through this crowd. If you would just raise your hand and say, that's me, man. I need Jesus. I need to receive the Lord today. My eyes are moving right now through this crowd. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Say, man, I need the Lord today. I'm coming through. I'm in the middle. Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Anybody else? You say, I need Jesus today. All the way into this right middle section. You'd say, I need the Lord. Yeah, buddy. Good. Good. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Good. Anybody else over far right here? Say, I need the Lord in my life. Awesome. All of you that raise your hands, could you just take two seconds and look at me? First of all, best decision you've ever made in your life. It is the most transforming thing that will ever happen to you. These people right here, would you give them a little wave? This is our, this is our start team. And then during this uh, last song, would you just go, or when service ends, would you just grab the person that brought you and just walk over there and go into this little room? They want to give you a little booklet, and they want to pray with you. It's nothing weird. It's, it's all above board and good. And welcome to the family of God. It's an awesome thing. It, it really is. So, Father, help us today. I want to live out your dreams in Jesus' name. Amen.